Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to the first Art House, Art House, Feeble Lecture of the Year 2024 on the Inspirare Arts Foundation platform. We are very privileged to have as our first speaker in 2024, Dr. Gillian Dooley, who is joining us from far away Australia, Adelaide, Australia. Good evening, madam. Good evening. And welcome to Inspirare Arts Foundation's platform. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dooley is going to talk to us about a very interesting subject this afternoon, this evening, which is uh, music and Jane Austen. Uh, when we were talking, the, uh, my suggestion to Dr. Dooley was that we include the term musical elaborations in the title. Uh, we were fiddling with it at one point. And uh, it was simply because I was reminded of uh, Edward Said's very interesting and influential book, Musical Elaborations, 1991, and uh, his dabbling with music, because he was one who was suggesting a very interesting thing about uh, bringing music into the public realm, music which was defined as something which was a, of a private sphere, belonging to the private sphere. So he was an advocate of bringing it into the public sphere, making it a part of social criticism and critical theory. Uh, so obviously he had his uh, uh, predecessor Adorno, of course, Theodore Adorno, with his uh, predilection for the music of uh, Beethoven and Schoenberg, as we all know. Today we have Dr. Dooley talking to us about the sense and sensibility of Jane Austen being affected by music. Uh, the music that she grew up with, that was around her in the atmosphere, in the air that she breathes, and how possibly she could have used it in the art of her fiction, in the fictional art. So, uh, um, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Dooley, who is an honorary associate professor in English and chair music advisory committee at Flinders University, South Australia. She has written extensively on literary and historical subjects, including, of course, the works of J.M. Kudzir, V.S. Naipaul, and the maritime explorer Matthew Flinders. Her latest monograph was on Iris Murdoch, and it was a very interesting title, Listening to Iris Murdoch, Music, Sounds, and Silences from Paul Gray Macmillan in 2022. And her forthcoming book is on Jane Austen. She played and sang Jane Austen and music from the Manchester University Press. Uh, without further ado, let's move to Dr. Dooley's lecture. But let's, let's preface it by saying that uh, it could not have come at a more timely uh, moment uh, in Calcutta, at least. We are having the Calcutta Book Fair, not very far from where I'm sitting. Uh, and uh, Britain happens to be, the UK happens to be the theme nation in this year's book fair. And there is actually a Jane Austen Park at the book fair, I'm told, this year. So uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be treading Jane Austen Park, but slightly differently uh, today. Dr. Dooley, the floor is yours. And thank you thank so you. much for joining us on this platform. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm extremely honoured to be to be part of this wonderful organisation. and um, And very happy to be um, able to talk to you about this what has, has really been almost a lifelong pa passion for me the um the the works of Jane Austen and and music brought together um which um is something I've been looking at for something like um you know 40 50 years or something <laughs> but um more in detail in uh, more like about um about 25 years um so what, what happened about 25 years ago or 20 years ago was that I discovered that there is um, uh, there was a there's a collection of music that belonged to Jane Austen and her family, um, and uh, so uh, we um, we have these books of music which uh, which 
survive from Jane Austen's time. They belonged to her and, and her family. And so we have um, evidence of what music that she, that she actually knew. Now I will share my screen. Um, um, No. What's going on here? Okay, sorry. Now, is that visible? So, um, so Jane Austen had this, uh, as I said, this collection of, of music. Um, and the, the, her family contained a, a, a small circle of musical women, including some of Jane's uh, nieces and sisters-in-law, um, and a collection of their music books are both printed and handwritten, including Jane's own handwritten manuscript books has come down to us via the family. The music collection is now available to view on the Internet Archive, and I have indexed the collection in detail for the, uh, the University of Southampton Library catalogue. Um, and uh, my book, as uh, Devasish very kindly pointed out, is coming out uh, next, or oh, nearly in, in, uh, in about six weeks' time. Um, and um, the, uh, that's a list of the, the chapters in, in the book, in case you're interested. So, a lot of what we know about Jane Austen and music comes from her niece Caroline. A lot, of, a lot of the sort of uh, stories about her, her as a musician. She was Caroline was the youngest daughter, the youngest child of Jane Austen's eldest brother James, and his wife Mary, née Lloyd. She was also the niece of Martha Lloyd, Jane's close friend and housemate from 1806 in uh, Southampton and Chawton. Uniquely among her younger relatives, it seems, um, uh, Caroline actively shared both um, Austen's um, literary and musical pursuits. Um, Jane Austen, uh, uh, Caroline was writing stories by the age of 10 and like her siblings, she would send her stories to her aunt and receive kind encouragement and in, in, in advice back. But she was apparently the only musical one in that household. She was only 12 when Austen died, but much of what we know directly about Austen's musicianship relies on Caroline's memories, as well as letters that Caroline received from her beloved aunt in her last years. Um, 50 years later, in about 1867, Caroline records her memories of standing by the pianoforte at Chawton Cottage and hearing Aunt Jane play and sometimes sing. Her account is frequently quoted, um, and um, I won't read it all, but she, she said uh, she had no one to teach. She was never induced to play, play in company, and none of her family cared much for it, for music. Um, she chose her practising time before breakfast, practised regularly every morning, very pretty tunes, um, but the music would now be thought disgracefully easy. So a lot of what has been assumed about Jane Austen's music practice is based on this passage. The remark about none of the family caring much for music is an interesting, has been particularly influential. And uh, the idea of the music being disgracefully easy is also a very interesting one. And I wonder whether she realised, Caroline realised that um, Jane Austen would have been improvising accompaniments from the bare outlines that appear on the pages of many of the music books that she knew so well at a later time when piano accompaniments were more usually composed and printed in full in, in the sheet music. Um, and here's an example. So we can see uh, on the left the, the kind of music that, that was around at the time. There's just the, the melody and a bass line and then continues there, 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 there. Whereas here we've, to, to make an, a performing arrangement, we've added some notes into the second part, the, the right hand of the piano. 
um, to fill out the, the harmony. Um, so firstly, I will talk about um, the, um, aside from Jane Austen's, uh, Caroline's reminiscences, with the main sources of information we have about her music comes from her own writings and her novels and her juvenilia. Um, and what I'm going to do first in this lecture is to look at the, the juvenilia, the juvenile songs and lessons, the things that she was writing when she was a teenager, um, and uh, look at what music she was also playing and singing at the same time. Those stories, the poems and scraps, she calls them, some of them, uh, the, these that she wrote in her teenage years are now well known, um, crazy and irreverent and, and rather transgressive miniatures of a wildly creative mind playing with and experimenting with literature. And during those same years, she was studying music and forming a collection of songs and keyboard pieces, uh, many of which would stay with her throughout her life. The details and dates are uncertain, but sometime after her return from school, in 1786, where she began her music studies, a piano was bought for her, and she seems to have been having still having lessons 10 years later. Not all the music that she studied is known, but there are some music books belonging to her that survive among the family music collections, including three manuscript books with piano music and songs copied out in her own hand. These music manuscripts are those of a practicing musician written for herself to perform, and therefore it seems likely that she had both lessons and regular access to an instrument from, um, from at least the early 1790s um, when she was, you know, in, in her, in her mid-teens. Although at least one of her teachers, George William Chard, was an assistant organist at Winchester Cathedral, most of her music, surviving music, was secular and much of it is vocal music. About half is, is songs rather than piano pieces. And the songs that she played and sang during her teenage years exhibit um, many, many fact, many um, aspects, but among those are irony, absurd humour, shallow sentimentality, political protest. Uh, some she joyfully mimics while mercilessly mocking others. I'll draw on several examples to show Austen engaging in dialogue with these songs in various ways in her juvenilia. Now, um, the, the uh, British critic um, uh, Catherine Sutherland and uh, her colleague Freya Johnson observe that ju Austen's juvenilia or teenage writings, as they prefer to call them, uh, were not intended for the author's private use. Rather, they were written and prepared for sociable reading and for circulation and performance among family and friends. Uh, and this intent may have also applied to at least some of the music manuscript books. Um, I, I think there are about 160, 170 pieces of music, um, separate pieces of music written in Jane Austen's handwriting, apparently across the course of her life. And the music, uh, these are copies. She didn't compose music. These are copies of, of people's music. Um, you know, in those days, music was very expensive to buy and there were no photocopiers. So if you wanted a copy of something, you needed to, um, to, to, to write it out yourself, to copy it out yourself by, by hand. Um, the music dates for, um, from the 1780s onwards. Uh, with the latest piece of music, as far as I can find, being a little uh, dance, which I haven't been able to identify, called The Waterloo, which uh, obviously came from after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, um, in the last, uh, you know, two years of her life. So what music was feeding the creative imagination of the young artist when she was a teenager? There's no way she, we can know for absolute certain what music um, Austen particularly liked to play and sing in her teenage years. Uh, decades later, her niece Caroline recorded memories of a few songs that she sang to her as a child, and we'll have a look at them later. But in this early period, we can only guess that those songs that Jane took the trouble to copy by hand into her manuscript book might have been favourites. 
though it would also, of course, be revealing if she spent um, money on buying expensive uh, sheet music. Um, in the teenage writings, uh, Austen occasionally includes a song lyric. Um, in the uh, in the juvenile in the introduction to the Juvenilia Press edition, I think I've got that here. Yes, uh, the Juvenilia Press edition of Fred Frederick and Elfrida. Sylvia Hunt, the editor, writes that the Juvenilia are not only the apprentice work of a budding writer, but also a commentary through parody on the ridiculous aspects of the sentimental novel. Austen's music collection shows that she was also aware, aware of the ridiculous aspects of the sentimental song. Austen writes three song lyrics for Frederick and Elfrida. Um, one, um, yes, here we go, on the screen here. Uh, one is in the best folk song tradition is overheard by the characters while they're out walking. Um, that Damon was in love with me, I thought, I once thought and believed. And now that he is not, I see, I fear I was deceived. Um, and there's a there's a song in her in a music collection um, called um, How Gentle Was My Damon's Air, which is by the uh, great um, 18th century English um, composer Thomas Arne. So this is this is a um, a little bit of that that um, recitative and aria. Dr. Julie, are we up to speed with the slides? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, 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 oh. Dr. Julie, are we up to speed with the slides? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, 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 Dr. Julie, are we up to speed with the slides? Is everything working? Um, okay, so um, the also in um, in that same hello. story. Hello. Hello. So, are we are we audible? Is it working? Thank you. 
Okay, I think I think I think it's working out all right, Doctor Dooley. Okay. We can go ahead. Go keep going. We can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Right. So where are we? Uh, where am I up to now? Here we go. So um, in the uh, in in also in Frederick and Elfrida, uh, we. Uh, we have this epitaph on the death of Charlotte, who, who has extricated herself from a tricky romantic situation by throwing herself into a deep stream which ran through her aunt's pleasure gardens, pleasure grounds in Portland Place, which is a ludicrous con con concept if you, if you know London, and floats conveniently but impossibly to her home village, though not and though not, it's not a, an explicitly a song, it has many uh, possible mus musical models, including My Filida by Miss Mellish, who, um, who, which is almost silly enough um, in parts to have been written by the Jane Austen, um, uh, the young Jane Austen. Um, and uh, a sample runs something like, her corpse shall be attended by maids in fair array till obsequies are ended and she is wrapped in clay Ding dong, my philida is dead. I'll stick a branch of willow at my fair filly's head. So it's, a, it's the same sort of silly, um, reductive, um, ridiculous sort of um, uh, doggerel um, with trying to be uh, beautiful uh, rhymes. And, and she, in fact, in the book, uh, she follows it by uh, the pro, a prose she continues the story by saying these sweet lines as pathetic as beautiful were never read by anyone who passed that way without a shower of tears which if they should fail of exciting in you reader your mind must be unworthy to peruse them and so she thus cavalierly disposes of one of the main characters in the in the story possibly for the sole purpose of composing sweet pathetic and beautiful lines on her and having directed this unexpected beam of authorial bossiness towards the unwary reader, the narrator skips off to relate the next scene, in which Rebecca's mother, another character's mother, is persuaded at the point of a dagger to allow her to marry her fiancé forthwith. Naturally, they celebrate with a song about Corridon buying a ribbon for Bess, which, uh, with which she made herself look very fess, festive, I think, Corridon, like Damon, is a stock romantic name. The bridegroom in James Hook's delightful 1784 pastoral song, "The Wedding Day," which is one of Jane Austen's um, in one of Jane Austen's manuscript books as well. Um, in the first act of a comedy, a mere two pages sets up a, a complete farcical plot complete with two songs sung by Chloe and a chorus of playboys, which could be uh, like Gilbert and Sullivan, really. It's very funny. The 18th century English stage was, of course, teeming with these sort of knockabout musical comedies, and Austen must have seen some of them. Uh, her music collection includes many songs from the theatre, often musically quite simple, with straightforward harmonies and tunes borrowed from Italian opera or Scottish folk music. Um, in in her own ode to pity, this is a this is a, a a rather parodic little poem that she wrote. This is just an extract. Um, it was 1793, so that was when she was 17. Uh, she delights in the humour of the high flown language. Um, she writes the paths of honour and the myrtle grove, and juxtaposes it with gently brawling down the turnpike road. Sweetly noisy falls the silent stream. Um, this little comic ode could have been could have had an, any number of models, but who else but the teenage Austen could write these these particular words: the hut, the cot, the grot, and chapel, chapel queer, and eke the abbey too, a mouldering heap concealed by aged pines. Her head doth rear, and quite invisible doth take a peep. This comedy of contradictions, the abrupt, abrupt changes in register. An absurd wordplay is clearly something Austen relished in her own work and no doubt enjoyed in that of other writers and musicians. Now, Charles Dibden, 
um, was an important composer and musician in the in the uh, Georgian London of Jane Austen's time, and uh, she seems he seems to have been one of Jane Austen's favourite composers as well. Um, Sutherland and Catherine Sutherland, who I mentioned earlier, discusses the influence of Alexander Pope and Samuel Johnson on Austen's capacity to engineer comic flops and to stage a series of triumphant verbal and syntactic letdowns. They might have added the songwriter Charles Dibden to this duo. Four of Dibden's songs appear in Austen's teenage repertoire and others crop up in later volumes of her music. She seems to have gravitated more to him than almost any other of the composers of the time. Now, one of the songs from the, um, uh, he wrote these entertainments of, of a whole lot of songs, um, and uh, it's called The Joys of the Country, um, and it appears in Jane Austen's uh, manuscript book. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of rollicking, funny, um, un, 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 not very genteel song, I would say. But here's a little a little uh, extract from it. Which song are we playing, Dr. Dooley? Uh, I can ask the tech guys to play the song. Sorry? Which song are we playing, Dr. Dooley? Uh, I can ask the tech guys to play the song. Oh, the joys of the country. Sorry? This... Which song are we playing, Dr. Dooley? Uh, I can ask the tech guys to play the song. Oh, the joys of the country. Oh, the joys of the country. Sound up, it's the joys of the country by Charles Dibbing. You can play the song, please. Rondo, if you can hear me, please play the song. Is it working, Chandu?
Uh, Dr. Zuli, can you share your screen, please, like we did in the trial run? Mm. Uh, Dr. Zuli, can you share your screen, please, like we did in the trial run? I am sharing it. Um, I don't know why. Oh, goodness, sorry. I'm sorry, I don't know why this is not working. Uh, did you find the present button, madam? Yes, but the, it's not letting me, it's telling me I have to restart Chrome. Um, share screen. Select a tab. I think I think we should go ahead with the with the talk, and we can uh, get the music fixed maybe later. At at the moment, at the moment, okay. I think we should uh, go forward with the with the talk. And let sorry. the technology sort itself out, sort oh, of. Sorry. Sorry, so, um, oh, well. Okay. Um, so we, we, <laughs> um, so we, we won't be able to hear the music then, do you think? Or, um, okay. I'll, I'll continue. Yes. Okay, so um, where are we? So well, I was playing, I was trying to play the song, The, jo the Joys of the Country. As of now, this seems to be an issue. Uh, my tech guys can't open the, the music files. Uh, I think it's not showing on your computer as well. I think there are issues there. So we will see uh, if we can play the songs at the end, uh, possibly. Uh, let them try. Meanwhile, if they can get it all worked up, uh, we can have the songs at the end, if possible. Uh, hmm, so you can just talk around it. Uh, okay. We shall see. And the slides can come. Uh, we shall see about the songs, if we can solve the problem. Right. Um, okay, so we were looking at... You can't see... Can you see my screen? No, the, my PowerPoint presentation or not? Yes, okay. Right, okay. So in this in this first verse, we have... A comic litany of contradictions. We enjoy the May bush, but for the thorns, it's warm as long as it's not snowing. The sun charms when it shines. 
The refrain celebrates the mountains and valleys and bushes in one breath to come to pigs and screech owls and thrushes in the next line. A comic juxtaposition of the sublime and the ridiculous. And Austen often employs this tactic in her teenage writing. Um, in Love and Friendship, for example, the protagonist Laura writes, the place was suited to meditation. A grove of full-grown elms sheltered us from the uh, from the east, a bed of full-grown nettles from the west. Before us ran the murmuring brook and behind us ran the turnpike road. Um, this passage echoes the, the contradictions in this, um, in this piece of music, of course. Um, the very masculine second verse, um, next slide, yes, um, of, um, um, of the, the Dibden's Joys of the Country, uh, the men are hunting and fishing, um, and they can see the, um, the rain that begins while they're walking with their female relatives off, offers the delighted singer and his friends the vision of diaphanous clothing clinging to the figures of each fair she. Um, so the hyperbolic world of this verse is very kin to much of the juvenilia. One might think of uh, Sir William Montague in, the, um, in, in that story of that name. Uh, his park well stocked with deer and he refused to get married on the 1st of May because the 1st of September because he was a shot and could not support the idea of losing that day, uh, day's um, um, uh, sport. Um, and uh, the, his propensity to fall violently in love with every young, lovely young woman he sees. Um, in the third verse, uh, the jokes continue. Um, the, the jokes continue with heavy irony that rem might remind us of Mary Crawford's amused horror at the country ways decades later in Mansfield Park. Um, so this is a very urban sensibil sensibility despite the ironic joys of the country he's talking about. Um, and then there's, you know, the third verse has, has people getting drunk in it and, and so does Jane Austen's juvenilia in, in um, Jack and Alice. Uh, the bottle being pretty briskly pushed about, the whole party were carried home dead drunk, she writes, um, in you know, in her sort of mid-teens. So Austen and Dibden clearly shared the same comic tradition of ludicrous juxtapositions, hyperbole and melodic, uh, the mocker, mockery of masculine swaggering and drunkenness. And Austen obviously enjoyed Dibden's well-crafted and singable songs, which she must have sung herself, without any uh, qualms about their being in a, an explicitly mas masculine subject position. Um, Austen would have enjoyed the license, I think, to escape the confines of femininity when singing these songs. And singing even in private is a way of taking on and trying out different subject positions and could only have stimulated Austen's creative imagination. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, many, um, in many other songs in uh, Austen's music books, um, going forward or not? Um, the, the singer is explicitly male in many of these other books. Oh, there, thank you, thank you. Um, the singer is explicitly male, but they often have let very uh, little else in common with Dibden's comic songs. For example, The Mansion of Peace by Samuel Webb um, is a highly sentimental love song in a strain that's satirised in many of the teenage pieces. Uh, in a collection of letters from 1792, Henrietta's lover, Musgrove, writes, Adorable Henrietta, how beautiful you are. I declare you are quite divine. You are more than mortal. You are an angel. You are Venus herself. And this passage shares the same... Um, uh, strain of hyperbolic flattery is the lyrics of the mansion of peace um here we are um i don't know if we can play this can we play this perhaps not um well we can you can listen to it later perhaps um 
And uh, so this kind of lyric was typical of the artificial and formulaic 18th century poetic diction that the Romantic movement um, rejected and that Austen mocked so gleefully in a collection of letters and other teenage writings. Austen's naive and rather gullible character, Henrietta, might have been just as delighted with the inane flattery of this song as she had been with Musgrove's love letter, uh, which is contained in the, the collection of letters, um, that, that volume called Collection of Letters, which exaggerates these tropes even more. Another song is directly referenced in, in, this, um, in this story. Henrietta's friend, Lady Scudamore, reports Musgrove, the, 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 uh, Henrietta's suitor, saying, yes, I am in love, I feel it now, and Henrietta Holton has undone me, which Henrietta finds a sweet way of declaring his passion. Uh, these lines are, are um, adapted from a lyric um, an early 18th century lyric by um, a poem called William, a poet called William Whitehead, and he writes. Uh, I think we've got that. Have I got that on the PowerPoint? Um, um, yes, yes, I'm in love. I feel it now, and Celia has undone me, etc. Uh, so it's the same. It's the, it's, it's a, just a direct parody of that thing. And it's lucky, um, Jane Austen's joke, that Henrietta didn't hear the whole poem because it's not my, quite as flattering as she might expect. Um, oh, no, we've gone too far. So anyway, so Jane Austen certainly knew this poem because in one of its musical settings, uh, perhaps in one of its musical settings, because it's um, it, she quotes it again in Mansfield Park when uh, Henry Crawford tells his sister Mary that he's fallen in love with Penny Price about how the pleasing plague had stolen on him. And that's a line from this song. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting that she she keeps, uh, she refers to these, to the, this uh, twice, sort of 25 years apart, this this piece of, uh, this verse, which is, has been set to music so often in her lifetime. Um, and undercut, it uh, undercuts the, the, artificial sentimentality of songs like The Mansion of Peace, more subtly but as surely as Austen's Juvenilia satirises the sentimental fiction. Um, so the next one is um, the, um, the Queen Mary's Lamentation. Thank you, this is the one. A more serious type of lament, uh, a, 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 a lamentation, so that the manuscript Queen Mary's Lamentation also appears in this manuscript book. Um, there's a long tradition of lamentations, which um, which were sort of written in the in the in the uh, voice, as it were, of, of a historical figure. Often, in in many cases, a queen awaiting execution. The two lamentations in uh, Austen's manuscript book are a ballad titled "Captivity." first published in 1793, and this version of Queen Mary's Lamentation from 1782. Captivity is one of several songs about Marie Antoinette composed at the time by English musicians. Um, um, but the theme of the imprisoned queen uh, lamenting her fate um, continues after the, this captivity with this um, Queen Mary's Lamentation, which is about Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, are we able to see the next slide um, with the words on it? <clears throat> I suppose we can't hear the music. Thank you. 
Okay, that, that was the, the mansion of peace that I was talking about earlier. Um, now we've got Queen Mary's Lamentation. Um, so we've got a, uh, this is, this. so here we go. This is the, the lament of the Mary Queen of Scots, not written by Mary Queen of Scots, but written um, about, about her. Um, and then what, uh, what, what happens was that um, in the history, in Jane Austen's history of England, her, her, her parodic um, history that she wrote as a teenager, um, she um, wrote a, 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 an attack on Queen Elizabeth in favour of Queen Mary. And um, the recording uh, that I've got, I want to play, if we can do that, is actually the, a reading of some of that, um, an extract from that, um, from that, from that um, book rather than the, than music. So, if we can go on to slide uh, twenty one and play that track. was abandoned by her son, confined by her cousin, abused, reproached and vilified by all, what must not her most noble mind have suffered when informed that Elizabeth had given orders of her death? Yet she bore it with the most unshaken fortitude, firm in her mind, constant in her religion, and prepared herself to meet the cruel fate to which she was doomed, with a magnanimity that could alone bewitching princess whose only threat was then the Duke of Norfolk and whose only ones are now who was abandoned by her son, confined by her cousin, abused, reproached and vilified by all what must not her most noble mind have suffered when informed that Elizabeth had given orders of her death yet she bore it with the most unshaken firm in her mind, constant in her religion, and prepared herself to meet the cruel fate to which she was doomed, with a magnanimity that could alone proceed from pottery. Oh, what must this be? Which oh, we need to stop it. It's, thank you. <laughs> um, so, some, this song that uh, this song, Queen Mary's Lamentation, um, dramatizes Mary's plight. Uh, it's some lines in the second verse stand out, such as, I burn with contempt for my foes, and false woman in ages to come, thy malice detested shall be. And um, of course, Austen's version is more explicit, but also more musical in its rhetoric than the rather stilted verse of the song itself. Um, there's no doubting Austen's strong partiality for the Stuart cause and her awareness of the historical context. Uh, so can we go on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So G.K. Chesterton, who wrote, um, uh, who, who made an early edition of the Juvenilia, of a, a selection from the Juvenilia, she, he wrote that... Um, there is not a shadow of indication anywhere that this independent intellect and laughing spirit was other than contented with a narrow domestic routine in which she wrote a story as domestic as a diary in the intervals of pies and puddings without so much as looking out the window to notice the French Revolution. But, you know, this in this edition, um, that edition that he, he was introducing there was included the history of England which, although often very funny, is an explicitly Jacobite text. And the evidence of Austen's uh, manuscript book of songs, which contains the lament of Marie Antoinette, as I've mentioned, and, um, and also the Marseillaise, the French national anthem, and other songs with political ang angles, both explicit and implicit, 
further complicates this. Austen could not have composed the high-spirited and eloquent fragments in her teenage years without a knowledge of the theatrical world of the, her day and the contents of Austen's music collection provide further insights into the evolving picture of the historical, social and cultural milieu in which she wrote. So that brings to a, a, a close the first part of this talk. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, the next part is, um, is looking at a, a ballad that she knew, that Austen knew, called Colin and Lucy, alongside uh, Sense and Sensibility. So um, the potential for music to influence not just song lyrics, but also textual rhetoric in Austen's fiction, I, I believe, is pervasive. And I've been particularly struck by a long ballad in seven parts titled Colin and Lucy, which is a 1783 setting by um, a, Tommaso Giordani, a, 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 an Italian um, composer working in Dublin, um, of a 1725 poem by uh, Thomas Tickle, Tickle, or Tickle, describing the betrayal and death and revenge of a wronged woman. And the printed music of this ballad is uh, on the screen there, and it's uh, it's that's Jane Austen's own copy. That's a copy, that's a picture of it. Several incidents included in this song are echoed and perhaps deliberately parodied in Austen's novel *Sense and Sensibility*, though the rhetoric and imagery are strikingly different. The novel's language, though often dramatic, is matter-of-fact and literal. Austen undercuts and alters the ballad's musical and lyrical rhetoric and its poetry, poetic image in her treatment of similarly dramatic, though not fatal, events in her novel. Uh, I'm not saying that she, she necessarily based um, Sense and Sensibility on this ballad, just that I've seen some parallels. The outline of the ballad story is this. Lucy, a beautiful young woman of Leinster from uh, Dublin, is abandoned by her lover, Colin, for a richer woman. Uh, Lucy falls ill and as her death and Colin wed Colin's wedding day approach, she asks her friends to carry her corpse to the wedding feast and to present it to Colin. Colin is immediately struck dead with remorse and he and Lucy are buried together. Their grave becomes a site of pilgrimage for lovers and a warning for the unfaithful swain. So there are clearly parallels between Lucy and Colin's story and the abortive love plot in Sense and Sensibility. A beautiful young woman, Lucy or Marianne, is courted and then abandoned for a richer woman. There's a confrontation. The young woman falls ill and nearly dies. Her former lover, uh, Colin or Willoughby, learning of her illness reacts in an extreme and dramatic way. The outcomes, of course, are different. Marianne recovers and marries sensibly. Willoughby returns to the wife he believes he will never love. The differences are as telling as the similarities and don't concern only the facts, but the rhetoric of their narration, partly explained by the different genres, narrative poetry, narrative poetry versus fiction in the comic tradition. So the kind of figurative language which is inseparable from Tickle's vein of poetry, and indeed which Austen herself sometimes uses in her rare forays into verse, is inimical to her, na her narrative voice except when used in quotation or occasionally dialogue when a character is being self-consciously literary. This allies Austen more closely with the naturalistic rhetoric of the theatre than with the poetic diction of the 18th century. But the emotional force of, of sense and sensibility doesn't arise from the narrator's ironic deni denial of figurative language. There's a rhythm in Austen's prose which always rewards reading it aloud and which shares with it shares which it shares with musical phrasing. Repetition sequences and pauses are common, and remind us that Austen was herself a practicing musician. And this embodiment of music playing and singing might provide a bridge between the florid melodrama of Tickle's ballad and Austen's reworking of its plot elements in a novel of complex and ambiguous power. Um, by itself, the verse is uh, cliched, rather cliched and rather wooden, the tone melodramatic and full of sentimental excess. 
However, though, though the musical setting is perhaps no great work of genius, the, the piece as a whole has an emotional impact well beyond that of the verse um, on its own. Uh, Giordani has set these nine stanzas um, with a piano accompaniment in seven sections. And despite the elevated poetic rhetoric of the lyrics, the music in this first section has more in common with the opening chapter of Sense and Sensibility, not without dramatic intensity, but in essence, expository, restraining any tendency to extremes. The voice is the narrator's sympathetic and impersonal. Um, have we got, uh, if we could go back to previous slide, um, by and uh, that that one yes and play that track if we can. So after, um, in section two, we, um, by Lucy Warned, that takes us to the warning voice of sense that uh, embodied by Eleanor Dashwood in, in Sense and Sensibility, in a warning to easy, fair and, and perjured swains, if we can have a look at the next slide, with musical figures imitating a bell. Um, that's the one, yes. Yes. Um, it has an oddly calm trance-like effect akin to Eleanor's Calm Desperation by Marianne's sickbed. Um, so, and then we get the, um, the dying words to the virgins. So um, can we listen to some of that? It doesn't have to be the whole thing. Is that going to work? That will do. That's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so th then there's a there's a rather doleful introduction then, and then we get to section three. I heard a voice, which introduces to us to Lucy's own voice for the first time, in a sweetly lilting melody, setting the words describing her hallucinations. The word "die" is set low in the voice, but otherwise the tune rema remains undramatic, repetitive, and slightly ethereal. And this has a slightly trance-like effect 
they convey acceptance reminiscence of rem, reminiscent of Marianne's speech to Eleanor setting out the plan for her new life of rational employment at Barton Cottage, rational employment and self-control. We will take long walks together every day. We will walk to the farm on the edge of the down and see how the children go on. We will walk to St. Jo Sir John's new plantations. We will often go to, down, go to the old ruins. I know, she, I know we shall be happy. I know the summer will pass happily away, she says. But there's wistfulness, of course, in this plan, which represents Mar for Marianne a kind of life beyond the death of her hopes of happiness. The summer which she's anticipating will not be the season of happiness for her. That hopeful spring has passed long ago with Willoughby's, Willoughby's attentions. The foreboding note struck in that phrase used so early in the novel has always seemed to me to be one of the saddest pieces of writing in all of Austen's work. She could have written, Marianne was happy at this time, or even it was a season of happiness, but the chill finality of the definite article rules out a return to happiness in the same way that Lucy sings with fatal certainty in early youth, I die. Um, so you can see that there. So that one was actually the fourth section, which is uh, Lucy addressing her friends, but giving her, giving her, um, giving them instructions for the next day. So um, perhaps we could have a look at those words if we could in, on the next slide. Um, they uh, she, they're saying she's telling them what to do. So she's to that they're, they're to take her her dead body to the wedding and present it to Colin. Um, and uh, there we are, he, he in his wedding trim, so, ga so gay, I in my winding sheet. So that's, that's what we've just heard there. Um, and the short fifth section of the cantata on the next, on the next slide starts uh, with very high drama. She spoke, she died, um, if we can go forward to the next one. She spoke, there, there we are. She spoke, she died. Um, yes, um, it's, uh, this section continues in F minor with a, um, this phrase, he and his wedding trim so gay, uh, 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 repeated, um, accompanied only by octave. So if, can we listen to this, this little extract? See if that, that works. So this um, short section, though simple musically, contains the most dramatic music in the whole cantata. Um, and, 
you know, at moments of high drama, high emotions, short exclamations are natural, as is repetition. Um, and it reminds me of the when Edward um, turns up at uh, Barton Cottage and he says, and they, they're saying, you know, is Mrs. Ferrers in town? And he says, perhaps you mean my brother, you mean Mrs. Mrs. Robert Ferrers. Mrs. Robert Ferrers was repeated by Marianne and her mother in an accent of utmost amazement. So it's the same kind of rhetorical gesture of, of interruption and uh, repetition. Um, the static nature of this passage echoes the short repetitive phrases into the most dramatic part of the cantata. So then the, the next, the sixth section provides a startling contrast to the previously uh, starkly simple section. The voice of the narrator returns, telling the story in a pleasant, prosaic and slightly florid melody which only takes on a darker tone after Colin's confusion, shame, remorse, despair, uh, moving to a minor key um, for the damps of death uh, bedewed his bow, brow and dramatic pauses between the, um, the phrases, he groaned, he shook, he fell. Um, I'm not sure if we've got time to listen to a bit of this, have we? I'm not sure how. That um, sort of matter of fact setting of the first part of this section, which such dramatic events related with almost ironic detachment, um, is perhaps akin to the narrative voice which appears from time to time in Sense and Sensibility. Uh, for example, Marianne would have thought herself very inexcusable had she been able to sleep at all the first night after parting from Willoughby. And the last part with those short phrases punctuated by pauses is more in the vein of the incomplete sentence interrupted by a dash, which so often, as John Wiltshire, the wonderful John Wiltshire critic, John Wiltshire, writes, is used as a retardant intensifier, a space in which the reader is invited to fill with feeling. Um, and you can you can hear this is a, obviously a live recording of the of the music, and you can hear the audience um, uh, enjoying the, uh, the the jokes in the, the, the sort of uh, rhetorical jokes in the, in the music. So part seven, the last part, so starts somberly, but soon takes us via a really quite lovely melody with an unusually lyrical accompaniment to the happy ending of this tragic tale. One mould with her beneath one sod forever he remains and, and you know, just very pretty melody. Um, and um, the, piece, the, end, the piece ends with a reprise of a sombre beginning motif, warning the swain forsworn to stay away from the hallowed spot. Um, and um, it, the, there, it ends with so, sort of sprightly ornaments and leaps, which rather belie the stern in warning. So although the ballad of Colin and Lucy ends with the death and burial, their ending is, has an, a romantic overlay which is denied to the love story of Marianne and Willoughby. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, I forgot to turn my camera on again. Um, yes, so the their ending, the ending of Sense and Sensibility has a romantic overlay which is actually denied 
to the uh, love story of 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 sen and sense and sensibility. The Colin and Lucy one has the has the romantic ending. The music to which the conclusion is set by Giordani is lyric and lyrical and con conform con com comforting, in the same way that Austen's concluding paragraphs are. Colonel Brandon was now as happy as all those who best loved him believed him believed he deserved to be. In Marianne, he was consoled for every past affliction. Her regard and her society restored his mind to animation her, and his spirits to cheerfulness. And the next paragraph sounds as a note of warning to the perjured swain. Willoughby could not hear of her marriage without a pang, and his punishment was soon complete in the voluntary forgiveness of Mrs Smith, etc. And with this brief, soberly ironic note, the, the novel draws to a close with the romantic hero consigned to an unromantic marriage rather than a romantic death, and both the heroines unexpectedly married into happily compatible situations. That little ironic flourish at the end of the novel is another version of Giordani's slightly inappropriate gaiety at the end of the cantata. So as I said, whether any of these echoes from Tickle's Ballad and Giordani's Cantata I have excavated in Sense and Sensibility have any basis in actual influence, um, whether there are genuine parallels to be drawn can't be known. I just think of it as, as, a, as a possibility. Um, it seems natural to me that the music she played and sang would influence um, the rhythms and melodies of her writing. Um, and uh, music appears in various guises in all of Austen's novels, although not very prominently in Northanger Abbey. There are fascinating possibilities to explore when looking at her novels in parallel with her music collection. But, of course, I don't have time to follow that up now. We're, but I want now to go to the end of Austen's short life to look at the music she was still singing for her, for her own pleasure and that of her young relatives at the end of her life. So if we can move on to the four last songs slide now. Um, in 1870, Caroline Austin, her niece, wrote that Aunt Jane had nearly left off singing, so forward a bit. Um, Aunt Jane had nearly left off singing by the time I can recollect much about her performances, but she remembered these three songs and gives a few words of each one. And they're all in the wider music family collection. Um, there we are. So in a letter to uh, her, her, um, her father, Caroline also quotes a letter that she'd received from her cousin, uh, Fulwell William Fowle, and he remembers another song as well. So there are four songs that, we were, that are remembered more than 50 years after she died uh, by her younger relatives as that she sang. Musically, these songs are all harmonically straightforward, um, typical of music of this period. They're very attractive. What they re all require, what they have in common, is that they need to be sung with conviction and the clarity of diction that comes with good vocal technique. Each one of them tells a story um, and they all sort of talk about, they're all sort of love songs um, in a way. Um, the... Uh, the these songs um these the, the song uh the yellow head laddies about a scottish a young scottish man who's in danger of being made to force um to marry a woman he doesn't love i know my love knows about a, a woman who is um um not very happy about her husband leaving but she knows she, she can't stop him so she's saying you know um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not angry. I'm not, honestly. I'm not. Um, and um, there's the Robert Burns song, the song from Burns. It's the only Burns lyric among her um, her manuscript book. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's also a sort of Scottish um, patriotic song. Um, and then there's the French song, Que j'aime avoir les écondelles, How I Love to See the Swallows, um, which is about and love is about to be separated as well. Um, so um, these, uh, some of these songs are, uh, they contain both humour and pathos, though not perhaps the broad comedy that appears 
elsewhere among Austen's manuscripts, like in some of those Charles Dibden songs we were talking about. Um, in the Burns song and the wife's where well, the humour is more in the way the sentiments are expressed. The music reinforces the point of view in both cases, with the most emphatic parts of Burns' rhetoric in the high part of the voice. And in the wife's farewell, a melody that kind of wheedles and cycles back to the phrase, no, my love, no. And um, learning that Kelly song, that uh, oh, no, my love, no, um, uh, and singing it myself to family and friends has given me insight into its biting irony beyond what I'd just gathered from reading it on the page. The singer has to act the role of a woman who clearly knows her lover's intention and is determined not to put herself at a disadvantage by openly venting her anger. The pathos is more pronounced in the other two songs where the comic element is, um, is absent. We don't discover the fate of this yellow-haired laddie. Will he be forced to marry the wrong woman? And the swallows, the French song, they depict the dire fate of lovers forced to part with no ironic overlay. So, um, I don't think we've probably got time to to listen to any of those music tracks, but um, the, the, you can you can go to my Jane Austen's music web, website and find find some music tracks there. Oh, but um, the, the, you can you can, you can certainly can listen to, to one. Jane Austen's music web, website and find. We can certainly listen to one, uh, ma'am. Uh, I think at least uh, one of them, maybe both of them, both of them. We can hear both of them. Yes. Chandok, would you please play the songs? Um, so in his book Jane Austen and Mozart a very interesting book from 1983 um, a critic musicologist Robert Wallace lists the classical and neoclassical val values of balance equilibrium proportion, symmetry clarity restraint, wit and elegance as typical of the music that Jane Austen played on her square piano. I would add that when performing her vocal music, she gave voice to an infinite range of subject positions, feminine, masculine, sentimental, witty, happy, unhappy, defiant and submissive, proud and abject, petulant and noble. The classical values what Wallace mentions are certainly characteristic of Austen's fiction, but so is the emotional range. To be found in the songs. Um, so can we go on to slide 34? Um, she played and she also sang and her voice was the instrument that stayed with her all her life whether she used it or not. It's almost too obvious to say that, her, that a singer is her own instrument but it's worth thinking about what that means. Automata, automata were already in his in her lifetime being invented that could play instruments after a fashion, um, like the piano, even the piano. But only a living being could sing. To hear singing in Austen's lifetime, before sound recording, of course, you had to be in the presence of a human being. She played and sang. Much of her music collection was vocal music, that gives an idea of what she might have sung and that 50 and 50 years after her death, the trace of her voice 
remained in memories of some of her surviving relatives and were recorded for posterity. So on the face of it, most of these songs could be described as love songs in the same way that her novels are regarded as romances. However, these love songs have the capacity to express a wide range of individual human emotions and a singer is embodying those emotions every time she sings them. The practice of singing and feeling the drama of each scenario cannot, I believe, have failed to influence the singer when she sat at her desk to write and the rhetoric of music naturally flowed into the musicality of her prose. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. <clears throat> that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm so happy the, the music could actually be played. Uh, okay, let, let's thank just... You, thank you so much, ma'am. Let's, let's hear the music first. Let's hear the music oh, yes. first and then uh, we, can, we can wind it up. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chandok, for playing that piece of music, The Charms of This Jane. And we have been charmed by Dr. Dooley today, talking about one of these Janes, the inimitable Jane Austen. Uh, we've been strung with song lines between Adelaide and Kolkata, and maybe even the rest of the world. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, you, you know, it was, it was evident that, uh, uh, and I, I must say that uh, you may have caught it in passing in one of those slides, that Dr. Dooley is also a very accomplished singer herself, and she regularly performs uh, songs and music. So the deft year, and uh, especially during the technical glitches, I could see the the, the singer, the the, the, the musician, the, someone who had music so in, ingrained in herself. I mean, she she was shuddering at the glitches of the recording, and uh, when the recording was not coming on, would it come on? You could actually see that. So it is with that deft ear that she has uh, brought that knowledge of music, that sensibility of her own to a reading, to an understanding of Jane Austen and the uses to which she put music. Uh, we have been given a, a privileged view into Austen's laboratory of writing, you know, where all the ideas came together, it's the sights and sounds, let's put it this way. and. Uh, how her fiction, you know, we teach it in classes, how her fiction actually reached out uh, to the larger social and political spheres by way of a musical shorthand, you know, you might say. And uh, I don't know if we have time, maybe we have uh, just a couple of minutes. I would want to ask Dr. Dooley about, you know, this, this very idea, you know, one of the great challenges of writing a novel is dialogue. 
how people speak, how they, uh, and how that shapes the, the narrative going forward. And uh, listening to your talk today, it was very evident that the cantatas that uh, she sang, she knew, uh, she, she lived around, shaped the way in which she wrote actually her novels. And, and that's where I think uh, from cantata to, to proper fiction, there's this wonderful bridge. Uh, if you could just say a couple of words before we, we finish today's event. Yes, well, uh, I mean, I, it's it's something that um, that I think uh, you can you can definitely see it in the cadences of of some of her some of her writing and and the, the that passage from um, the Queen Mary uh, the the history of England really shows that that rhetor that rhetorical rhythm that she had. Um, and and it, it does sometimes also appear in 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 the dialogue in her novels, um, especially when there's a sort of dramatic and there's the, the theatre was incredibly important to Jane Austen as well, and a lot of these songs are theatre songs as well. Um, so it, it was it was look part of as I see it part of sort of embodying a, a character not just writing about a character but embodying the character and 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 sort of um, becoming them when you're when you're when you're writing them does that make does that makes sense <laughs> I had another question, but I don't think we have time for it. You know, you did mention, especially in the context of this particular song, about her sympathies towards the Stuart cause. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, uh, just from the top of my head, you know, a lot has been made about the relationship or the lack of it between her and uh, the uh, fictional monster of that period, Walter Scott. And uh, we know about the, the context, the historical context of his novels. So it's very interesting that uh, you have actually unearthed over here uh, mm -hmm. a, a secret, uh, you might say, a, a, a leaning towards the Stuart cause. And that might actually be the subject of another talk, perhaps. Uh, and how, how, how those two, I mean, you know, yes. he was the acknowledged uh, bestseller and uh, the, the, yes. the popular personality. Yes. And here was Jane Austen somewhere writing from the shadows of this great yeah. uh, figure but they seem to have these these little political leanings or, yeah, or interested yeah. uh, areas of yeah. research and, and writing which yes. bring them very close together probably another book another talk uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh, dr dooley for joining thank us you. from far away australia uh, thank you so much. inspirare arts foundation actually th uh, thinks about bringing together two art forms many art forms together the language of different art forms together, the fugal coming together of different languages, artistic languages. Today we have had this wonderful exchange between music and, lit and literature, proper literature, fiction. Uh, hopefully we'll have more programs, more events uh, in the future where we'll be able to bring together these voices. Uh, and uh, thank you to the backroom staff today, uh, Chondok and uh, Shomudip for managing the songs and uh, our song line connection between Adelaide and Kolkata. Uh, with that, uh, and with another vote of thanks to Dr. Dooley for joining us today, uh, we end today's session. Look out for more, folks. We'll be coming again to you with more wonderful events in future. Thank you so much. Thank you.